Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Wolfson. I'm the Associate Director for Research and Copyright Services here at the Law Library, uh, and I'm also the librarian who works with the IP Journal. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some tips and tools to conducting research, selecting your note topics, and things like this, generally using the library. So let's get into it. <clears throat> so first, a few notes about using the library and some terminology and things. First things first, we'll be open 24-7. You may already know this, or you may have forgotten from last semester, uh, but we're open 24-7. We don't staff the reference and circulation desks 24 hours, 24-7, but you can be in here doing work whenever you want. The reference desk, however, uh, is staffed Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5, Friday, 9 to 5, and then Sunday, 12 to 4. So that means there'll be a reference librarian or one of our, um, our student RAs there to help you if you can't find something or figure out a blue book citation or something like this. <laughs> Meanwhile, our circulation hours, uh, for the fall semester are going to be Monday through Thursday, 10 to 7, Friday, 7 to 7, and then Saturday, um, 9 to 5. Um, and, um, uh, and so you can, you know, the circulation desk is where you check out books. So if you need to borrow anything um, or you, you know, uh, need some help, like looking around the stacks, they can help you out at the circulation desk. As far as books go, so let's say that you're doing some citation checks and you, um, there are some books that we have in our collection uh, that you want to use. Well, one thing you can do is you can stack them. What stacking means is that you can borrow them to your journal, um, to your journal desk, your journal carol. Um, you can take them to the circulation desk and have them borrowed uh, under the journal's name uh, to your uh, to the IP journal's uh, carol. And this is a really good idea for a couple of reasons because. Oftentimes, when people are citing something uh, from a book, they'll use it in multiple different places. And so that, you know, if there are multiple people working on one article. You can share it between yourselves by having it in that space. And then second, uh, you know, you can make sure it doesn't go anywhere if like somebody else wanted to borrow it. Um, and then third, we'll know where it is and it will still be within the library if you forget to return it or if somebody else needs it, right? So if you do need to use a book, um, it's good to take it to the circulation desk and have it borrowed under the journal's name and then keep it with the journal carol. As far as the interlibrary loan goes, so interlibrary loan is where we don't have something um, uh, in our collection, either a, um, an article you can't get a hold of because we don't subscribe to that database or that journal, um, or uh, a book that we don't have in our um, uh, physically in our collection. Uh, we can borrow it from another library. This is called interlibrary loan. Okay, and, you know there's a good chance or some chance that you'll have to do that. One note I want to make for you uh, with uh, interlibrary loan, well, there's two notes actually. So first is to remember to check the main library's catalog. Um, so we don't share a catalog <clears throat> with the main library, which means the list of books and resources that we have access to is different than the list of books and resources that the main library has access to. Um, and so, uh, and of course, they have many more things than we do because it's much larger. Much larger. <clears throat> so if we don't have something, you always want to make sure to check with the main library to see if they may have it, because you can just go borrow it from them instead of from us. But let's say they don't have it, you can then ask us to enter library loan uh, it uh, for you. However, one thing I should know is that you want to coordinate with each other and with your editor before you just put in an ILL request um, uh, with us. And that's because, as I said, oftentimes authors will cite uh, multiple works within, you know, or uh, cite one work multiple times within their papers. And so we don't want multiple people who are working on this article all submitting an ILL for the same resource. So make sure to work with your editor um, before submitting an ILL request. Okay. I'm going to go through some, a few resources that you may or may not know about, um, but that will be useful for you both in citation checking and for when you're conducting your research for your student note. So first, Gavel versus Gill. I already mentioned this. So Gavel is what we call our catalog. That is the list of books and electronic resources um, that we have access to uh, in the law library. So we call that Gavel. Gill, however, is the main library's catalog. And like I said, they're not the same. Uh, there's some overlap. We have some of the same resources, but they're not the same, right? <clears throat> so if you want to check to see what the main library has, you need to look at the main library's web page. If you want to see what we have, you have to look at our web page. So you look at Gavel for us and Gill for the main library. There's also Galileo. Galileo is um, the digital library of Georgia. So it's all of the resources that we singularly don't subscribe to but that the university system of Georgia does. And so you can get a lot of things through Galileo that we may not have like physically present uh, here uh, in Athens. Now, if everything works uh, correctly with uh, Gill, with the main library's catalog, you won't even, you'll har probably hardly notice that you're using Galileo. But just so you know, it is a different thing. We have access to some things through the system uh, that we don't have specifically through University of Georgia. 
Second, I want to point out Bloomberg Law, and this is specific. Uh, I want to point, point out specifically because um, uh, for you and IP, because Bloomberg has some really interesting and good resources specific to IP. So first, there's the IP Law Practice Center. <clears throat> it's really, really good for trademark. It's also quite good for patents and copyrights. It's just especially good for trademark. And then these practice centers um, that have a list of resources and other materials uh, available for you that are just specific to that area of the law. So you go to the trademark one, and there's less stuff for trademark law. Again, it's really useful uh, if you're out in practice, um, but also for when you're conducting your student note or if you're trying to find something. The other thing I want to point out is USPQ. <clears throat> so USPQ is United States Patent Quarterly. It's a reporter that um, just publishes intellectual property cases. Um, and especially, you know, uh, people who've been doing uh, who've been doing work in intellectual property for a long time, um, you'll see them cite sometimes the USPQ site because it had its own organizational scheme and cases would come out there earlier. And so USPQ comes up sometimes. However, you might not recognize this. Blue USPQ itself, though, is on Bloomberg Law. So if somebody references like a headnote in uh, USPQ or a USPQ citation, you can pull those things through Bloomberg Law. Finally, and the most important thing I want to mention is dockets. Um, so a lot of times people will come to me and say, hey, I'm trying to get hold of some uh, materials, some like orders or some filings uh, from a case, particularly like district court cases. Uh, so I need to get access to PACER. So PACER is, the, um, uh, is what the federal government uh, makes available for sort of everything that's filed in, uh, in, uh, in a federal case, in either district court or the court of appeals. Um, and so I need to get a hold of PACER. Uh, and I say almost invariably, I'll say, you don't really need PACER. You can use Bloomberg Law because our subscription will allow you to get a hold of the same stuff that's available in PACER. But the big difference to you is that PACER costs money. So it's some amount of, um, of cents per page, like three cents per page or something like this. Um, whereas Bloomberg uh, can get that stuff for you, uh, free to you. So you'll see a pop up when you request something uh, through uh, Bloomberg Dockets. And you'll say, oh, this you know, is going to cost some money for us to go and get. But because of our subscription, you won't pay anything. And there are some limitations, but you're unlikely to run, run into those uh, limitations. So if you're looking for district court cases, filings in cases, you can't find them anywhere else, you need to get a hold of the docket, go to Bloomberg Law, don't deal with PACER. Um, I mean, you, you can try to use PACER, but it's just, uh, you're not getting yourself any better than what Bloomberg Law has. I want to mention legislative insight and ProQuest Congressional. ProQuest Congressional in particular, although there's some like overlapping these uh, resources. So this is particularly good if you're looking for um, like legislative history materials, you know, uh, congressional reports, CRS reports, things like this. Um, maybe somebody cites to you know some legislative history materials for an older uh, an older bill, you know, from the 40s or 70s or you know 50s or something like that. And you just don't know where to find it. You can get those things through ProQuest Congressional or Legislative Insight. These are tools that are specific for legislative history documents and research. And it's also great for if you're conducting your student note, student note and you need to look up the legislative history for whatever um, uh, piece of legislation you're looking at, you can find sort of every piece of legislative, uh, legislative history uh, that is attached to a bill um, through Legislative in, uh, Insight and ProQuest Congressional. They're amazing tools, they're super powerful. And again, if you're looking for legislative history materials, it's kind of the best place to look. And then I want to mention WorldCat. So WorldCat uh, is um, uh, it is a catalog of catalogs. So libraries like our own, like you know, essentially every uh, library in the country, um, they have their own catalogs, right? And they report to OCLC, the organization that uh, puts together WorldCat, and says, this is what we have uh, in our collection. Uh, and then WorldCat allows you to search across those. So let's say you need to find something through ILL or something we don't have. Um, you can look it up on WorldCat and see what libraries local to us do have. It. Um, if like only libraries and if like only one library has it and then libraries in like Germany or something, um, it's possible your the title is different or something's fu something funny is going on. Or it means that it might be, uh, it might be that we have a hard time getting a hold of it on, in ILL. But if you do look up some, uh, something in WorldCat and it turns out that you know Emory has it and other local libraries, it's just that we don't, it indicates that A, you're looking at the right thing, and that B, we should be able to get it through ILA. Okay, I want to shift gears here and talk about the Blue Book for a minute because you know a lot of what you'll be doing um, on journal is citation checking and you know, trying to figure out uh, whether people have cited something properly on Blue Book. Um, and a couple notes about that. Um, so first things first is that the inside cover and the index are great places for you to quick reference, to find what you're looking for. 
the inside cover in particular sort of will get you I don't know, like 70% of the way there because it gives you um, samples of what sort of basic citation types should look like. And then if you can't find it from there, what you're trying to find, um, you can look in the index for whatever you're trying to look for. Um, and hopefully there'll be an index heading and you can just find it sort of right within the book. Um, that's kind of the first step to figuring out uh, blue book citations. Now, let's say you just like, that doesn't help and you still don't know how to find, so, you know, how to cite something. One great thing to do is to find an example. And particularly, it's great to find an example that um, your journal has published. And the reason for that is because those citations have already been vetted. You know, multiple editors have already looked through it and it's been published. And so it's most likely that that is the correct way to cite whatever it is. And it's unlikely that you're going to come across a like, truly new thing that nobody has ever tried to cite before. Um, so go ahead and look uh, and see if you can find an example of either the same, same resource or a similar resource, and then use that example as a template for creating your Blue Book citations or for checking somebody else's Blue Book citations. Now, what about, you know, what can you find on the web if the blue book just seems like gobbledygook to you and you don't understand it? Well, there's a lot of resources on the web. I list just a few here um, that can kind of help you along the way. Georgetown has a lot of guides for a variety of different um, uh, legal research questions. Uh, their blue book citation guide is good. Suffolk has one. Duke has this kind of quick tips thing that's pretty good. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't mention University of Texas's uh, blue book guide because I helped to create it when I was at University of Texas. And it's quite good. I used it just the other day. And then finally, if you just really can't figure out how to cite something, you can't find a sample, the online resources aren't helping you, just try Googling it. You know, there's some chance that somebody has already, you know, had this problem and said, oh, I figured it out and put it online. Um, or if you're having a hard time finding an example before, Google may help you find an example. I Google citation questions all the time. It's really, it can uh, uh, be quite useful. A few more things on citations. Um, so sometimes you'll come across like an abbreviation in a citation, like a journal abbreviation or something like that. You just really don't know what like the full title is. And so that is leading to problems with finding the article or finding whatever the journal is, how to cite it, something like this. Well, um, there is a tool that can help you understand these abbreviations it's called the Cardiff Index to Legal Abbreviations. Basically you type the abbreviation in there and it'll give you back what the full title is. Um, additionally, sometimes people will cite things that aren't in Blue Book. Um, they'll cite to APA, uh, AMA, uh, or Chicago style. Those are quite different, um, and they can be sort of hard to read if you're unfamiliar with them. Well, Purdue has this great online writing lab, the Purdue OWL, um, that just kind of walks you through all types of different citation types. Uh, and so it can help uh, you figure out what these citations are, or if you do have to write for some reason, write a citation in one of those other formats, that can get you a lot of the way there. And then finally, one more thing about citations. That remember that the point of citing something is to tell a reader where they can go find it, right? It's because in the law, we make a lot of assertions, but we don't, we don't usually make assertions uh, that have no support. Uh, we want to back up everything we say uh, to say, look, somebody has already figured this out. I'm just relying on their work, right? Um, and so the reason why we cite something is so that a reader can say, ah, I want to make sure that what you've said is accurate. And so I will go and pull that thing and see if it's actually true, right? And so the point here is that when you're doing blue booking, when you're creating your own blue book citations for your note, or whether you're um, checking somebody else's citations, is that if the citation doesn't indicate where they, somebody can go find something, it's probably wrong. Now I know you're you're sort of new to this, and it might you know you might think that none of these things are you know written in a way that anybody could figure out where the citation goes to. Um, but really, you know, once you get used to it, it should be a at least a little bit intuitive at least insofar as you should be able to tell when something's wrong. And if it looks wrong, if it's not telling you where to go find something, it almost certainly is wrong. So keep that in mind when you're doing your site checks or writing your own citations. Okay, we're shifting gears again. We're gonna talk about picking note topics. So people come to me often to talk about how to pick note topics. And the thing that I always say to everybody is try to write about something that interests you. Um, so you're gonna have to spend a lot of time uh, with this project throughout the semester, even you know throughout the year, possibly even longer if you have to you know do some edits to it or like some legislation happens uh, that affects your um, uh, your note, like like happened to my note. Um, and you don't really want to be like suffering through something that doesn't interest you, right? So try to think about what you like um, and what you would like to write on. Um, and then we can try to figure out how you can have an uh, intellectual property hook to that. Now, sometimes we can't do that, but really think about, like, again, what you would like to write on, what interests you. And I, it's going to make your note better. It's going to make your life happier. 
Now, second, how do you pick a note topic? Where do you find possible topics or note or figure out if there is an intellectual property hook to what you want to talk about? What you really, what you really want to do is look at current awareness resources um, and or circuit splits. Uh, if you don't have like any ideas or, you know, you're looking for some inspiration. So current awareness resources are not a thing that gets uh, talked about a lot in law school, um, but it's particularly in your first year. We talk about it a little bit in first year legal research, um, but these are resources that help you understand like what's going on in the law currently. In law school, you read a lot of cases that have, you know, been around for 30, 100, 200 years, right, and well-established law, but the law is changing all the time. Every time a new case comes out, it potentially changes how we understand the law, right? Um, and so there are resources that kind of tell you what's going on on like the ground level of the law. And this, as it turns out, is a great place to write a note on, right? Because like, oh, there's this development in the law. That means it's new. That means it's interesting, possibly. And so you can write on that. Circuit splits, on the other hand, is a resource that tells you where two different circuit courts, um, uh, two different circuits understand an area of the law differently. They apply the law differently uh, in, uh, across circuits, right? <clears throat> and the reason why this is a great place uh, for a student note uh, is because um, these are cases that oftentimes wind up in the Supreme Court, right? There's a controversy. There's a divide in how we apply the law in the country. And so the uh, Supreme Court should come in or might come in and resolve that. And there's a resource that collects and reports on these circuit splits. It's called circuit splits. It's on Bloomberg Law. Um, and uh, it's a really good place to look for uh, new note topics. And then with all of this, you can come talk to me and try to figure something out. It's, it's best if when you come talk to me, you give me some ideas ahead of time of what, what you're interested in. If you've done any pri pre, uh, prior research on this, uh, you can send some of that to me so I can pr get prepared to talk to you. Or if you come in and I can sort of shotgun you, shotgun throw uh, topics at you for a while until something sticks, that's okay too. It's a little bit harder and it's not, you know, it's not as efficient. Um, but we can try to figure something out. So if you really can't figure anything out, please make an appointment with me and we can talk about it. Now, I already mentioned current awareness resources. I want to mention some specific current awareness resources to intellectual property uh, that uh, may help you find a topic or conduct a research. Mm -hmm. So first is Law360. I use Law360 all of the time. Law360 is available to you through, um, uh, through your Lexis accounts, uh, and it's a legal news resource. There's a specific section on intellectual property law. It just, again, talks about like what cases are going on in IP law. It's a great place to find out, um, uh, you know, again, to find no topics and to find out like how the law is developing in copyright trademarks, uh, copyright trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. <clears throat> Patent Leo is a great blog about patent law. Um, like patent lawyers regularly read Patent, o, patent Leo because it's so good, you know, so well written, uh, and it has a, like a great understanding of patent law. Copy Hype uh, is a um, uh, is a copyright blog, and it's notable because it is um, so. A lot of blogs out there on copyright are sort of uh, fair use maximalists. Let's call them the people who really believe that uh, in a greater application of fair use and sort of a weaker. Uh, copyright law. Well, copyright hype, uh, copy hype is takes the opposite stance. Uh, it belongs in a, it believes in a stronger author's rights, stronger copyright. Um, and I point this out again because so much of what's written online takes the other uh, takes the other approach. Uh, this one takes a good, well reasoned, uh, well um, well cited approach uh, uh, to the opposite side. There's a trademark and copyright law blog. This is mostly for trademark, even though it's called the trademark and copyright law blog. It's a good blog. Talks about what's going on in trademark law. Similarly, likelihood of confusion is mostly about trademark law. And then I already mentioned circuit splits, and it's available on Bloomberg Law. All right, a couple of additional tips. This is about both site checking and doing your own research. So first is that Google Scholar is a great place for finding articles, and finding articles are in PDF. Why is it important to find them in PDF? Well, you need that for your citation because Bluebook wants you to make sure that you are... Um, uh, you have the uh, the accurately paginated item uh, both for when you are conducting your, uh, creating your citations and when you're site checking things. Google Scholar is great, particularly, particularly if you're on campus, because what it does is it will query what resources we have access to, um, and, uh, uh, and it will take you right there. So if we have access to something through Hein Online, Google Scholar will say, oh, they've got it on Hein Online. So when you click on that link, it'll take you right to Hein Online uh, and give you that PDF. 
Congress.gov and govinfo.gov are great for finding government docs. So I already mentioned like ProQuest and Legislative Insight and Congressional. Well, like modern congressional uh, documents are pretty much all on govinfo.gov and uh, congress.gov. So maybe anything since 2000 or you know, certainly anything since 2010, you can get the, these two resources in PDF form, oftentimes in authenticated form. And Blue Book says um, that if you have an authenticated document, uh, that is as good as print. That is as good as print. Uh, Google Advanced Search is another great way of finding, again, government docs, legislative history documents. You can manipulate Google in ways like you can fo focus on certain file types or certain websites, certain domain names um, to target your research better than just a, a flat Google search. Google is great, um, but it's even more great uh, when you know how to use it uh, like a power user. And Google Advanced Search is the first step to using it like a Google uh, power user. You also want to think about like when you're conducting your own research, um, searching by subject area within catalogs. So library catalogs have a lot of additional information that a lot of people um, don't really pay attention to. One of those is that let's say you find a book uh, that is on point for you. It has a list of uh, subject areas that are co contained within that book. Um, and the catalog will allow you to click on those subject areas. And what that will do is will take you to other books that are also on that subject area in our catalog, in our, in our library, right? So you find one book that's on point, you can use that to find other books that may also be on point, that are likely to be on point. Okay, and my final tip is don't be afraid to ask for help. So people make blue booking mistakes all the time. People have difficulty pinning down uh, note topics all the time. Don't be afraid to admit you're having trouble. Don't be afraid to admit you're confused. Ask me, ask somebody else, talk these things over. Um, it's really, you know, there's no reason uh, for you to feel like you just have to tough it out. You know, ask for help, right? And how can you contact me? Well, email is usually best. I'm stephen.wolfson at uga.edu. You can try calling. That's my number right there, 706-542-5149. And I'm always happy to set up a meeting, Zoom, or phone call to kind of help you figure out uh, what, you're what you're doing, what you're doing wrong, and help get you on your way. That's all I got for you. Uh, good luck, uh, and let me know uh, how I can help. Thanks. Bye.